evening and welcome to the Whalen Library. Thank you for coming to our first Great Presenters Program of 2024. We have a great lineup this year, so be sure to grab a flyer on your way out the door <laughs> and join us again. You can also find out on our website about upcoming speakers once a month. Tonight we are excited to have Wayland High School alumnus Jim Klump here to talk to us about his 2,700 mile hike along the Continental Divide Trail. Jim was born with a thirst for adventure. A day after his Wayland High School graduation in 1976, he and three friends hopped on their bicycles for a seven week ride from Boston to San Francisco. By his early 20s, Jim had hiked all 48 4,000 foot peaks in the White Mountains. In 2014, he left his job as a software engineer to hike the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine. And in 2018, he did it again, this time from Mexico to Canada along the Pacific Crest Trail. In 2021, he retired to prepare for the Continental Divide Trail, the third and most difficult leg of the triple crown of long distance hiking. His 2022 through hike of the CDT nearly did him in as he limped the final thousand miles through Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana before having a hip replacement upon his return. Jim and his wife, Victoria, live in Newton where they raise their three children who are all now in their late 20s. Thank you so much to Jim for being here tonight. Just two housekeeping notes. Um, we are recording this session for broadcast on Waycam, our local cable access station and for the library's YouTube page, so you'll be able to rewatch and share. And Jim will speak for about an hour, and then we'll have some time for questions. So please hold your questions till the Q&A, and if you're joining us on Zoom, put your questions in the chat as you think of them, and then I will read them aloud when we get to the end. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, I really uh, being invited to come. Um, yes. Like uh, like it was said, I'll be talking for about an hour, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, so, obviously, I'll walk you through my 2022 Continental Divide Trail hike. But before I do that, I'd just like to... Jim, I wonder if my microphone needs to be shut off, because you're up here dipping in the mic. Could be. Does your microphone need to be shut off? Or? Just having some audio difficulties. All right. Um, is that better? All right. So, uh, just some some background on the trail before we actually get into the presentation here. Um, the CDT, otherwise known as the Continental Divide Trail, is a footpath from Mexico to Canada along the spine of the Rockies specifically along the Continental Divide, which is the dividing point in your watershed. Uh, rain falls to the west, it goes to the Pacific, and the east to the Atlantic. Uh, it's a Sorry to interrupt you. I'm not sure that you're... So let's turn that one off. Yeah, and turn that one. I'm sorry. Um, Yes, yeah, so the trail is approximately 3,000 miles long. It goes through five states and three national parks, those being Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, Yellowstone, and Glacier. Um, it has, or one of the things that makes this trail unique is all the alternates along the trail. There's over a dozen major alternates, anywhere from 10 miles to several hundred. So these are basically different tracks of the trail you can follow. And so basically everybody who hikes the CDT tends to have their own tailored journey. Uh, really no two people walk the exact same route generally. Um, when you hike the, the CDT, you'll basically be going up and down, climbing and descending approximately a half a million vertical feet. And that's equivalent to hiking from sea level up to the top of Everest about 16 times. The highest point is Gray's Peak at just over 14,000. And the lowest point is uh, Lordsburg, New Mexico at over 4,000. So if you've done any hiking up in the, the White Mountains in New Hampshire, uh, there's a list of 48 peaks there called 4,000 footers. Um, so basically uh, this entire trail is higher than the baseline elevation to make that list in New Hampshire. Um, 
typically takes a through hiker, a through hiker is somebody who hikes the entire length of the trail in one calendar year. It takes that person about four to six months to complete it. Um, and to date, um, about 1,200 people have completed uh, through hike the, uh, the CDT. Um, that's in comparison to the Appalachian Trail where about that number complete the trail every year as well as the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, the motto for the uh, CDT is embrace the brutality because it really is uh, a very challenging trail, both from or many reasons. Uh, navigation, uh, I was constantly lost when I was traveling this trail. Um, the, the trail towns are much further away from the trail in general once you get north of New Mexico. So you've got long hitches to get to, to basically do your resupply. Uh, water scarce in many places along the trail. You've got high elevation. There's just a lot of things that make this trail particularly difficult, especially compared to the AT and the PCT. So working up the, the right margin here, um, just talk briefly about the actual states the trail goes through and my general impressions of them. So New Mexico, um, when I think of my time, it took about a month to get through there. It's intense sunlight. There's basically for the, the month I was in New Mexico, I never saw a drop of rain. Um, and furthermore, there's like almost no shade at all in most places. Um, so that that's, uh, it makes it difficult. It's very dry. It can be windy at times, obviously hot. Um, and you start out around 4,000 feet just above that, uh, down in the boot heel of New Mexico. And by the time you get to Colorado, you've, you've gone over 11,000 feet and you drop down about 10,000 at the Colorado border. Uh, Colorado, um, is very high elevation. The average elevation in Colorado is about 10,000 feet along the CDT. Um, the first 200 miles in Colorado, you never drop below 10,000. Um, with that elevation, the, the air is pretty thin, so you tend to be you know, sucking wind a lot in the, the uphill climbs. It's constantly up and down in Colorado. Um, there's quite a bit of snow travel. Even in the year I did, 2022, which wasn't a particularly high snow year, there were still many days when I was hiking for long periods of time in the snow. And the one other thing about Colorado is it has uh, frequent, almost daily afternoon uh, thunderstorms. So you have, to be, you have to be careful about getting off the peaks and ridges uh, in the afternoon if you can. Uh, next state is Wyoming. Um, so I would say that is the state with the most variety of scenery. Uh, you kind of exit out of Colorado, climb down from the mountains, and pretty quickly you're into the Great Divide Basin, which is prairie and then followed by desert. And the, the Divide Basin is where the Continental Divide actually splits. Um, and in between that split is the basin where water falling into there never ends up in either ocean. It basically just percolates into the earth or evaporates. Uh, in uh, Central Wyoming, you go through the Wind River Range, one of the most spectacular parts of the CDT from a point of view of scenery and mosquitoes. Um, and uh, finally, you exit Wyoming via uh, Yellowstone National Park in the nor northwest corner. And then Idaho and Montana are uh, typically considered kind of together in that um, there's several hundred miles of the CDT that basically follow the border between those two states. So for, for like 300 miles, it's essentially left foot Idaho, right foot Montana. Um, eventually the trail takes a right hand turn and goes into Montana for the rest of the way, then turns north for a few hundred miles before finishing up in Glacier National Park at the border of Canada. So just a, a quick note about um, the CDT, it's, it's one of the three trails that comprise the Triple Crown of Long Distance Hiking. Um, and I did the other two in 2014, the AT, and 2018, the PCT. Uh, to date, um, around 660 people have completed the Triple Crown. And compare that to the number of people who've stood on top of Mount Everest, about 10 times that many, 6,600. So um, it's not something that a lot of people do. Okay, so this is the uh, southernmost point on the uh, 
the CDT, the so-called Southern Terminus. It's in the uh, boot heel of New Mexico in the um, Chihuahua Desert. Uh, it took me actually three days to get here. First day flew to Tucson, second day Greyhound to Lordsburg, New Mexico, and then I took a three or four hour, a three or four hour shuttle south in a pickup truck that literally would have, um, my, my Prius would have been in a thousand parts had I taken that on, along these dirt roads. Um, this area here is very hot, dry, and there's just nothing out there. It's incredibly desolate. It's very inhospitable territory. When I first laid eyes on this from the shuttle, I had this incredible feeling of both excitement and anxiety just because I knew this was going to be a real challenge for me. And so this is the first day, just some of the landscape you see. Um, one thing you may notice here is just the complete lack of trees. There's a bit of vegetation, but there's really nowhere at all to get shade. And as a result, um, people um, like my friend Sputnik here in the green, uh, many people would use umbrellas as not for rain because it never rains in New Mexico, but rather just to, to give them some uh, relief from the intense sunshine. Where the other guy base here who's uh, trying to carve out some shade in the, uh, the wall underneath this wash. A wash is basically a dry riverbed that for a month or two out of the year during the rainy season turns into this raging torrent, but most of the year it's, it's dry like this. So one of the things that helped me get through the um, pandemic was thinking about cowboy camping along the CDT. Cowboy camping is where you basically sleep under the stars without your tent, uh, as I was doing here on the first night. Um, I was actually tented at the first water cache, and I'll get to those in a second. Um, but it turns out that this night, um, this little uh, camp spot I had, my feet were pointed directly north. And um, I observed during the night that uh, I could see that the, uh, the North Star directly above my feet. And I woke up three or four times during the night and I observed the, the Big Dipper basically revolving around the North Star. It was really a pretty exciting feeling. Um, that, that's one thing about being outdoors, you know, for almost all the time over four or five months is you get really tuned to, to nature, to the stars, to the moon, um, to the weather, uh, much more so than when you're living in a traditional uh, society like most of us do. A uh, great thing about the desert is the incredible sunrises and sunsets you see pretty much on a daily basis. This is actually my second day on the trail, and I, I'd gone to bed the night before at 8 p.m. because what else are you going to do, you know, when you're out there and the sun's down, pretty much nothing. So you go to sleep, probably woke up at 3.30 or 4 and was hiking well before sunrise. So this was the sunrise I, I saw maybe after two hours on the trail. So I mentioned water caches. The, uh, the organization that manages the, the CDT, so-called CDTC, um, they keep these water caches stocked and the, um, the, the money we paid for the shuttles to get to the terminus helps to cover the cost of that. So basically there are these metal boxes with five gallon jugs of water um, and without these it would be really difficult to make it from the terminus to the, the first town of, of Lordsburg. Um, there's just so little water here that uh, you know you'd have to carry 40 pounds or so on your back. Question? Just quick, what, when, what time of year did you start? I started April 21st. April 21st. Yep. So I met a guy um, in the first week or so who he was uh, trying for the third time to hike the CDT. Uh, his name was Mountain Goat, and uh, we'd hi been hiking or walking along together for five minutes, and the next thing we knew, we'd lost the trail. And at that point, he told me, if you don't lose the trail at least once a day, you're not on the CDT. Um, and that really is spot on advice. So this slide attempts to provide an example of that. The trail just goes off in all different directions, um, and you just have to choose one, and um, you know, after 10 or 15 minutes, you look at your 
uh, navigation application on your phone, and you see, oh yeah, I'm, you know, whatever, 100 yards off to the right. So you, in this case, the, there's so little vegetation, you can just go cross country to regain the trail. You don't have to backtrack. Um, and this particular day, I probably lost a trail, I don't know, two dozen times. Another thing about the CDT is it crosses a lot of uh, the private land. Um, so as a result, there, there's agreements between the, the CDTC and, and the landowners to allow it, you know, the trail to pass. But there are these barbed wire fences that you're constantly having to climb over or crawl under. So this was uh, one of those instances where I was crawling on, under a fence uh, during the first week on the trail. So once you get north of the, the town of uh, Lordsburg, after 85 miles or so, there are no more of those metal boxes of water caches. So instead, you're basically sharing um, water with the, the cattle that are out there. Uh, during the course of the trail, I probably saw tens of thousands of cows out there. Um, and uh, so you can see here, this doesn't look like the most appetizing water. Uh, plenty of protein at floating at the top. But um, I, did, uh, I did filter all of my water along the way. And as a consequence, I believe, I, I never did get sick. But a lot of people choose not to filter water, and a lot of people get sick. Uh, this Actually, that's mountain goat on the far left, giving a thumbs up. Um, uh, this is one of the um, outposts along the way. It's actually called Doc Campbell's Post. Just a store out in the middle of nowhere, pretty much. But you can send packages, resupply packages here that you can pick up along the way. Um, so I sent myself several packages in New Mexico just because the, the opportunities for actually buying food in the towns is not quite so good in some of these places. So one of the, the first major alternates I took was called the Gila River Alternate. It runs along the Gila River through this narrow canyon for about 100 miles. And uh, when, it, when a cliff drops down to the river on one side, the trail crosses over. And there are no bridges here. So you're basically just um, fording the river, which is typically anywhere from you know, calf deep up to mid-thigh deep. Um, and over the course of three days, going up the Gila River alternate, I did this, I believe, around 240 times. So needless to say, during those three days, my feet were never dry. These are several people I hiked with uh, at various points. Clink in front, Mountain Goat, and then Low Branch. Low Branch got his name because when he was hiking the AT, he uh, smacked his head on a branch and passed out. So once we got north of the um, the Gila River alternate back on dry land here. Um, we came to this place where off the distance you can see, see some smoke. Now obviously, you know, smoke, uh, forest fires are a real problem out west, particularly these days. This is one of the, the first times where I was actually affected by a forest fire. We got up to where the trees are. The fire was burning right beside the, the forest road. And the folks battling the fire actually required that we jump into the back of their pickup truck and drive us through the, the, the area that was burning right beside the road. So there's about three miles of, um, of the CDT that I didn't hike. I rode in the back of a pickup truck, pickup truck on. Another um, supply point is in a town called Pie Town. Uh, the reason for that is because, um, at least on the day I arrived there, the only food available in town was pie. Um, the person who ran this hostel here called the Toaster House was kind enough to drive us 20 miles uh, to the west to, to another town that had a, a place where we'd get some burgers and fries. Um, and I'm not quite sure what the story is with these shoes, whether they're from people who have quit the trail or the shoes just wore out and they got a resupply of new shoes here. But um, one quick story about this is the guy in the far left there, um, his name is Cutie. Uh, Really nice guy. I met him a couple of times in New Mexico. And tragically, he was found dead in his tent up at high elevation in Colorado. I never did find out what he succumbed to, but it's, it was a real tragedy. So much of the CDT, uh, particularly New Mexico, runs along 
roads. Um, so the trail isn't completely finished in terms of you know getting off the roads. Uh, you can see that in a lot of cases these roads are very straight. And this particular place um, had a pack of llamas just kind of standing around on the side of the road. So I took this picture both to see a llama plus to give you an idea of um, just how straight and flat some of the roads are in New Mexico. So another uh, um, alternate that I took along with another guy I hiked with in New Mexico named uh, Uphill, um, the, the actual uh, trail itself ran along a paved highway in this, in this point. Um, you know, gravel or dirt highways or roads are not too bad to walk on. Uh, it's really not fun to walk on uh, pavement for long periods of time. Uh, it just really beats up your shoes and your feet and you get blisters easily. So the alternate we took went up on this mesa here. We actually slept um, at the top of the mesa um, that night and then we came down uh, one of the breaks between all these cliffs here uh, pretty harrowing descent along you know scree gravel and so forth um, at the bottom here we uh, we were beneficiaries of a really nice view of the Ventana arch here natural arch at the bottom so um, just after getting down from that mesa we went through a place called El Mal, El Mal Pace, which is definitely not pronounced that way in Spanish. I'm not, I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation, but it, it stands for the Badlands. And basically this is a volcanic rock that is solidified, but it's full of these cracks and fissures, and it's, it's an ideal place to break a, a trekking pole or to really get hurt if, you, if you're not real careful. There's just plenty of, uh, plenty of places where you could really, you know, sprain or, or you know break your ankle if you're not careful and it, unfortunately a couple of days after we went through here um, uphill started feeling a lot of pain in his in his feet um, and later I found out um, or learned that um, he had actually fractured his foot um, and kept walking on it and end up having to have surgery on it uh, by the time he got to Colorado so I took another alternate up and over Mount Taylor. This is the highest it had been so far, up at 11,000 feet. Um, and the trail is fairly steep going up here. So, you know, it hadn't been nearly this high up till that point. So I was really sucking wind pretty badly going up here. But the, the view is spectacular. And on the north side of Taylor, uh, I got the first, uh, saw snow and ice for the first time. So a few days after that, um, the, the CDT was running along a plateau up at about 8,000 feet, um, and we're entering this area in New Mexico with, with all sorts of canyons in it. And so um, this picture here is um, in one of those canyons that dropped down about 6,000 feet, um, and because of that, the canyon walls were basically blocking the cooling winds, and it also gets a lot hotter the lower down you get. So I had started out at the one side of this canyon with um, three liters of water. And I usually figure about five miles per liter. Um, what I didn't calculate was the fact that the additional heat and lack of breeze to cool me off um, meant that I was going to drink a lot water a lot faster than I ordinarily would. So um, about halfway across this 10 mile wide canyon, I realized that I was definitely going to run out of water before I got to the next source. And um, this was probably one of the most uncomfortable experiences I had on the entire CDT was basically having to ration water so I could make it to the, the water cache, you know, 10 miles away without, you know, without completely being out of water. So this is that cache that I finally arrived at. Um, it was maintained by this woman here, you know, basically gallon buckets of water, and I just, I basically just drank a gallon just straight off. I was complete dry mouth here. So an interesting thing about the CDT is just how sensitive um, the, the vegetation and scenery is toward the vegetation. So um, before, um, you know, at 8,000 feet, it's, you know, that a lot of short bushes and so forth. Once you get up to about 10,000, which we are here, all of a sudden 
you're in the so-called sky island where you get these massive pine trees and you know pine needles sitting on the trail it just it's what like walking on your bathroom carpet it's just a really very pleasant um, change of scenery here a day after this I'm walking through several feet deep snow um, you know snow piles so uh, yeah it's, it's it's pretty amazing how the the scenery changes instantaneously along the CDT in places just based on the elevation so um, this picture was taken at a place called Ghost Ranch. Um, George O'Keefe, the artist, used to hang out here for good reason. There's just amazing scenery to, to paint. Um, and I think the, the thing that stuck me, uh, struck me about this picture is just how happy through hikers look here. Um, you would think that, you know, when you're going um, five without a shower, um, you know, kind of hiking through really difficult terrain, getting hot and sweaty and so forth, you kind of be unhappy and grumpy and so forth, but just the opposite is the case with through hikers. They, they tend to be exceptionally happy people. Um, and in fact, the, the woman here in the foreground, her trail name is Happy. Um, I was particularly happy at this point because when I arrived here, I, it's the first time I had a um, connection, connectivity in a couple of days and I get a text from my daughter uh, informing me she'd been admitted to, to medical school, which she'd been really working hard at. So I was, I was actually in tears of happiness at this point. Oh, and one other thing that happened at uh, Ghost Ranch was that um, there had been fires breaking out further south by Santa Fe. And uh, as a result, um, several national forests were being closed, uh, national forests that the CDT ran through. Um, and I found out here that basically I had two and a half days to make it about 80 miles to the border of Colorado. So I n really needed to uh, you know, put on the jets to, to make it there before the trail was officially closed. Some of the scenery I passed along the way, uh, this was late in the day, the, the sun was low and shimmering off this river that was a thousand feet below the kind of the cliff we were walking along. It was just one of the, the most beautiful um, bits of scenery I saw on the entire trail, at least in, in New Mexico. So here I am at the Colorado border, um, and you would think, oh, I've just walked, you know, over 700 miles, there should be a brass band and, you know, um, whatever, uh, neon lights. And instead what you, you get here is like, a, you know, a signpost that's almost falling over. It's being held up by rusty barbed wire a couple of bashed up license plates, one from New Mexico, one from Colorado. Um, I guess the, the thing I learned about this is that the CDT really has a way of putting you in your place. It really humbles you. Um, and as you know, great a, an accomplishment you think you've had, that the CDT really doesn't care too much. But still, I was, I was extremely pleased and happy with uh, having reached New State. And I texted my wife and three kids that, hey, just, just made it to Colorado. So I took a couple of days off um, in uh, a town <clears throat> near the border, and I met this family here, the Nettebergs. Um, family of seven. One of the kids was one year, or right around one year old. In fact, she wasn't even walking yet, so they had to carry her in a backpack. And this family was hike through hiking the CDT. So I found it hard enough just to manage, you know, take care of myself on the, the trail. This family of seven here successfully, in the end, through hike the CDT the year I did. Um, furthermore, um, the, the girl in the black here, um, she's also the youngest person ever to have hiked, through hiked the Appalachian Trail at four years old. Her name is The Beast. <laughs> and the, the one-year-old in her mother's arms there, her trail name was Dead Weight. <laughs> so they were actually um, using a minivan to um, cover some of the sections that they were forced to, to skip because of those forest fires. So they asked for volunteer, and I volunteered to drive them 17 miles down the highway south of town. And then they all climbed out of the, the minivan and walked 
along the side of that highway north back to town. I ended up bumping into them in Glacier National Park towards the end. They had jumped around a bit, and but she basically shared a campsite with them, at, you know, 50 miles from the border. So once you uh, once you enter Colorado, you you uh, climb up into the San Juan Mountain Range. It's one of three mountain ranges in Colorado, um, and there happen to be a couple of storms kind of rolling through this area. So um, I'm sitting here behind a rock bivy. It's like a a short rock wall just to get some protection from the wind. Um, but the, the weather was definitely, you know, getting worse here. And um, we had some pretty rugged weather through the San Juans. So that night we set up our tents in dry ground here. The next morning we woke up to several inches of, of snow on the ground. Of course, it had been very wet the day before. So my shoes and socks, when I reached this campsite the night before, were soaked. And so this morning, I was forced to uh, use my camp stove to basically thaw out my shoes and socks so I actually get them on the next morning. So I've done a lot of winter hiking in New Hampshire, and a couple of days in, in the South San Juans here felt very much like this. Winter hiking, um, you know, lots of snow, uh, just it, very, very uh, scenic, but um, you know, pretty rugged as well. So hiking through the San Juans in Colorado, just views, you know, every time you turn a corner, you get, you know, an even more magical view than the last. Um, it just, uh, it was, you know, rugged but really wonderful um, couple of days here. One of my favorite campsites along the way um, was in this valley just surrounded by, on all sides by snow-covered peaks here. I set up my tent behind this tree to get a little protection from the wind. Um, and then, like I said, there's a lot of snow travel here, some of it on fairly steep, treacherous slopes. This one wasn't so bad, but um, probably during the course of, of hiking through Colorado, there were, I don't know, 200 traverses similar to this, some steeper, some less steep. So um, this is at uh, Wolf Creek Pass. Um, it's a pass that brings you down to uh, See, I'm blanking on the name of the town. Um, anyway, um, yeah, Pagosa Springs. So the two people, the woman third from the left and uh, the, the guy uh, next to her, um, they were people I met through a friend of mine from the Appalachian Trail. They happened to live in, in uh, Pagosa Springs, and they invited me and another guy from this group to their house for dinner. And then the next morning, early on a Sunday morning, they basically woke up early, um, picked eight of us up and drove us 25 miles or so back to Wolf Creek Pass so we could start hiking the next day. So that's, these people are an example of trail angels and that their act was an example of trail magic. And there was actually a lot of trail magic that occurred along the, uh, the way for me this, uh, that year. So this is actually one of the, probably one of the two um, most intense, scary moments for me along the CDT. Um, at this point, I'm hiking with a, a woman named Band-Aid uh, from Albany. And um, we had actually entered the San Juans. We kind of were both looking a little nervous and we, you know, kind of decided to team up to, to make it through the San Juans together. So we're, we're uh, crossing this very steep um, snow chute here early in the morning, maybe 8 o'clock or so. So the snow was still frozen from the night before. And um, it was clear that if you slipped, you were going to go 1,000 feet down before you stopped, and you'd probably hit the rocks at the bottom. So you, the only choice really was not to slip. <laughs> and there were probably... On this particular face were about 10 of these snow crossings, some of which were this steep, some a little less. Um, at one point I was, um, you know, the snow crossings would happen, then you'd some dry ground, then another snow crossing. And at one point I was in some dry ground, another guy passed me, um, and he uttered four words, which I'll never forget in my life. He said, there would be consequences. And I knew exactly what he meant. 
So after a few days, uh, four or five days in the San Juans, uh, time to resupply. So Bandit and I um, hiked down into a town called Silverton. It's an old uh, silver mining town um, with one paved road to the center of it, and it looks straight out of a movie set, as you can see here. So the, the CDT and the Colorado Trail actually coincide for about 300 miles through Colorado. Um, and in fact, this summer, my brother was hiking south in the Colorado Trail where I was going north in the CDT. Um, this is the high point in the Colorado Trail, a little over 13,000. Uh, the high point on the, uh, the CDT, on the other hand, is you know a few hundred miles north on Gray's Peak. So um, one of the things that you know becomes evident immediately when you're putting in 20, 30 miles a day, actually in Colorado is more like 15 or 20 a day, um, the, the number of calories you burn is just enormous. So this, I just took this picture to illustrate, um, you know, what a resupply in town looks like. This was actually intended to be five days, so each column kind of represents a day, and then some of the food on the right is kind of shared across multiple days. Um, I was real careful to make sure that I left town with enough food to make it to the next trail town because there's nothing worse than, than running out of food, you know, being a, way, a day away from the next town to, to resupply. Um, and even though this was intended for five days, um, unfortunately it only lasted four, but fortunately I made, happened to make it to the next town uh, in those four days. And I will say that there... There's no way you can keep up with your um, consumption or your, your consumption of calories cannot keep up with your, um, your burning of them. I mean, I would estimate I was probably burning 6,000 calories a day and you just cannot carry or eat enough food to actually keep up with that. So uh, it was typically my um, routine when I, every time I got into town, I'd eat at least three massive meals to try to you know, overcome some of that deficit. So I mentioned the afternoon thunderstorms in Colorado. Um, this, you can see here, some rain falling off in the distance. So whenever you, you know, whenever you see the skies to start to darken, you have to make sure you get off the peaks and the ridges because that's where the lightning is most likely to strike. Um, and uh, yeah, I was just doing a little research. I think Colorado is the fourth most likely state most dangerous state to be struck by lightning in, mainly because of the hiking in the in the Rockies. Um, so this is uh, just a typical um, uh, hiker hangout. Uh, this is actually called Hay Hayduk Hideout, Hideout, and it's in a town called Salida, Colorado. Just some guy um, who had previously hiked, I think, the Appalachian Trail. And he had this, this garage in his backyard, and he basically just turned it into a you know, hiker hostel. So uh, this is my sleeping bag and pad here in, in the, you know, on the floor there. And we got you know, a dozen other hikers sharing the space with me. So probably the, the most fun um, I had on the entire trail was about 30 seconds coming down from Lake Ann Pass here. So I'm, I'm, I've just come down from the top there, and you can see that lip of snow that's called a cornice. It's basically overhanging, and the, the CDT actually came down just to the left of that. And when I got to the top there, climbing up the other side, there was already a hiker on his way down um, with uh, his micro spikes in his feet. He had an ice axe, and he was facing to the, um, the snow field, which is pretty close to vertical, basically down climbing. And I had been, I'd heard rumors that it was actually possible to glissade down this, which is basically sit down and just slide. Um, it happened to be mid-afternoon, so the sun had been shining and softening up the snow. Um, so I, I thought there was a pretty good possibility that I could try just glissading down. Um, and so once the, the guy in front of me made it to that rock band there, I just got my nerve up, sat down, and, and let it go. And, and once I stuck in my heels and determined, yes, I'm going to be able to control my speed. Then I just started hooting and hollering like I was on a, a roller coaster. It was just, 
incredible amount of fun. And I covered, in the 10 minutes he, he you know, took to get from the top down to that rock ridge, I probably made it in 30 seconds. Um, so uh, here's two of my friends, um, uh, low branch in the middle. Uh, he unfortunately also slid down a snowfield, but at the bottom of it was a tree, and he actually ended up breaking his, his hip. And uh, on the right is uphill. He's the one who um, had a stress fracture in his foot, kept walking for another 100 miles because he really wanted to make it to Canada, and he ended up um, having to basically have two brakes in his foot operated on. Um, so he went back uphill, did to his hometown in Iowa to, to get it, uh, have the operation. And he missed the trail so much that he came back to Colorado and did trail magic along the way. So he was meeting me and other hikers at various road crossings, and he'd fill up his trunk with, uh, you know, beer and soda and food, you know, and, uh, you know, we just had, like, have you know, parties, you know, for an hour or two as, you know, in, our, in breaks in, in our hiking. So um, anyway, uh, there's a lot of camaraderie on the trail and, uh, you know, uphill was, was one of the best. Cool. Just an aspen grove. So they look a lot like birch trees, but there's lots of uh, these aspen trees in, in Colorado, which I really liked a lot. So um, the, the CDT doesn't go over Mount Elbert here, but since it was the highest peak in Colorado and the second highest in the lower 48, and it was only about a 10-mile side trip to get up to the top and back, I decided to go for it, and boy, was I happy I did, because get up to the top here, and for 1,000 miles all around you, you're the, the higher than everything else. So it you know, felt a little like being top of Mount Everest, Obviously not nearly as high, but it, it was a, a great feeling to, to be able to look down and everything around you. There's a marmot here, just a, a cute little animal. Um, I was just taking a break here, and this guy came along, and he was definitely tame. I'm sure other hikers had fed him in the past because he, you know, every time I turned my head, he was like going after my pack, wanted to get my food. I mean, you're not really supposed to feed wild animals because, you know, it's not good for them. They should remain wild. But um, this guy was, was extremely tame. So that is the, um, the top chairlift at Breckenridge Ski Area. Um, and the CDT goes over this ridge, maybe 500 feet higher than Breck, um, and down into the town of Breckenridge. And there... Um, I met up with a woman um, I'd met on the AT on the left, uh, uh, Vicky. Um, she and her husband, Howard, uh, had, Vicky was basically a trail angel of mine. Um, when I hiked the AT, met her, we've stayed in touch. And she asked me to, to have, basically to send her my schedule of you know, when I, th I thought I'd be going through Colorado. And she and Howard uh, rented a condo for a week. I happened to be pretty much on schedule so um, this guy in the middle here uh, in the light blue jacket, the brain, and I stayed with Vicky and, and Howard in, in her condo for a couple of nights. Um, and we basically just sat around and ate and slept. And then um, I stayed uh, for two nights with my son Anders here in the middle, who was a ski instructor at Vail in the winter and a golf pro there in the summer. So um, I stayed with him two nights. And then that's my brother Andy. He was hiking south in the Colorado Trail, and we rendezvoused on the CDT, hiked a few miles together, grabbed a beer in, in Breckenridge, and then Andy proceeded to hike south uh, further on the, the CT, and I, I went north in the CDT. So this is uh, this is the, behind me is the highest mountain, uh, Gray's Peak, in, in, uh, on the CDT. Um, and I'm standing on a peak uh, called Mount Edwards. So I'm at about 13.8. Uh, Gray's Peak is 14.2 uh, or so. And uh, what's not real clear is that there's this knife edge between me and Gray's Peak. And I've got um, you know, a reasonable uh, fear of heights. And this basically took all of my uh, courage to make it across that knife edge. Um, and uh, I happen to be taking this picture a couple hours later of this mountain goat, 
And just directly above the mountain goat is Mount Edwards, where the previous picture was taken. And then you can see the knife edge here running down, down towards the right. So basically, the knife edge, it's about 1,000 feet off either side. On the right of me, it's pretty much vertical. The ridge itself is just a couple of feet wide. Um, and then on the left side was a little less steep. So basically, if you go over on the right, you're toast. Forget about it. Uh, you fall on the left, well, you might break a couple of bones. But um, I was just inching along here, going at less than one mile an hour, um, just to try to navigate that knife edge and you know keep myself safe. Uh, that night, um, I slept at the highest point that I had in the entire trail. It was just, just below 13,000. I set up my tent just uh, as it was getting dark, so I didn't have a lot of choices about where to stay. Uh, so it was along this ridge. Um, seemed fine at the time. Uh, by the time I cooked dinner and got in the tent and started to, to fall asleep, all of a sudden the winds kicked up. And the next thing I knew, the wind was blowing so hard that I was afraid my tent was literally going to blow apart or that whole tent would just blow off the mountain. Um, the tent was literally getting pushed so hard that I felt like a wrestler getting pinned in a wrestling match. Um, I don't know how I fell asleep, but um, you know, hiking 25 miles at elevation will do it. Next morning I woke up, this was actually the, taken at like 5.30 the next morning to this beautiful sunrise and not a puff of wind. I had one of the best days ever, just ridge walking you know, through some of the high peaks in, in Colorado here. A couple of days after that, I was going over a peak in Colorado called James Peak. It's actually the last time the CDT goes up to 13,000 for northbounders. Um, about a mile from the summit, uh, it started snowing. By the time I got to the top, a blizzard had kicked up. Um, so I took a couple of quick selfies and then started down. And I got about five minutes down the mountain and realized I was headed down the wrong side of the mountain. And um, I had basically just gotten disoriented by the, the storm at the top. So I hiked back up to the top and more carefully looked around for the CDT heading north and found it. And a couple hours later, um, this is, was my campsite that night. So you can see this I'm five feet away from the CDT with the beautiful uh, sunset to the northwest. So these two women here are Kim Possible and Sparkle. Kim Possible was the woman I met on the AT who actually um, uh, introduced me to her friend in Pagosa Springs who gave me trail magic there. Kim Possible uh, rented a, a condo in um, Winter Park, Colorado. I spent a night there as I was going through. And then they met me several times along the trail to provide more trail magic to both me and anybody else who happened to be walking by. So these two women who I met eight years ago, or eight years previous to this, on the AT, we remained friends. And um, you know, Kim Possible was amazing for me. In fact, there, there's one other act of, of trail magic that she was responsible for later on, which I'll talk about in a bit. This is Parkview Mountain, the last time the the CDT goes over 12,000 feet. Um, and uh, so that basically the trail goes up to the top there. We can see a little building and then it goes down the ridge on the right. About halfway down that ridge, the skies darkened as they usually do in Colorado in the afternoon. And then a storm kicked up. And I was forced basically off the ridge a quarter mile or so and just hiked parallel to the ridge because um, it, otherwise it would have been too dangerous with all the lightning striking around. Probably the, the closest I've been, you know, in terms of uh, danger with lightning. So I met up with this woman um, on like my last day in Colorado. Her name's Old Soul. Uh, she's actually uh, this. She was attempting to complete the Triple Crown as well this year uh, from Pennsylvania. She was from, um, and we crossed into uh, Wyoming on the July fourth. So. So it's a nice way to celebrate the 4th is to, you know, enter a new state. And as you can see here, um, license plates uh, mark the, the boundary, although the one from Colorado had fallen off this tree and was lying on the ground. So the thing that amazed me about the CDT is these abrupt um, 
changes in scenery. So just after your, your you know, a day or so after you cross the border there, you, you hike out of the mountains in Colorado and you leave the forest and the next thing you know, you're walking through this beautiful field of flowers. Um, and then by the end of that day, you're out in the prairie that looks like this. In fact, this was taken from my campsite that night. And then a couple days later, you're in the Great Divide Basin here, which is basically going through the Red Desert. And just like in, you know, in southern New Mexico, the, the water is, is, is a real, um, real scarce through here, and it's very hot and dry. Um, so you really have to, uh, you know, carry a lot of water and, and really uh, camel up at every, at every water source, including this one here. Uh, water cache, it's left by not quite sure who, but I was really happy to, to find it here. Because the, the previous water source, which I was forced to water up at, um, was basically two ponds that had a million cows around it, and there was actually cow poop floating in the water, but um, we were forced to, to filter that water anyway because it was 20 miles to this water cache. So just as in New Mexico, there's a lot of road walking in Wyoming. And off in the distance here, you see the next mountain range, the Wind River Range. But before I got there, I went into this town, small little town in Wyoming called Atlantic City. And I stayed at a bed and breakfast run by this guy who also ran on the same property, a gun shop. Um, so I'm, you know, obviously from the east, um, not a big gun guy. Um, but I was really struck by just the amount of guns and just how much of an integral part of their lives, you know, guns are. I probably saw more guns on the CDT than I had all my life before that. So get into the, uh, into the Wind River Range and all of a sudden that scarce water is no longer scarce whatsoever. In fact, there's in many places in the winds, there's more water that you can possibly need or want. Um, one of the uh, wildlife I saw going through here was this moose. It was probably 10 feet tall. I probably weighed 600 pounds, and uh, I guess because of his size, he just was not bothered by my presence whatsoever. Nor should he be, I guess. So um, the winds had some amazing scenery, these mountains that just shot up into the sky, a lot of alpine lakes, and even though it's mid-July here, there's still you know, ice floating on some of the alpine lakes. Um, it also had, be, because the snow had just melted out, it had incredible mosquitoes that, you know, if you stopped for 10 seconds, you would have 100 mosquitoes in both arms. That was, put a bit of a damper on the, you know, the enjoyment that you could feel going through the winds. Uh, one of my favorite pictures was taken at sunrise here. This is actually Lonesome Lake, not to be confused with the Lonesome Lake in the White Mountains. And here's, uh, here's a couple of horse riders. Um, the CDT is open both to foot and horse travel. And you'll notice here this guy has a revolver on his left hip. So I met this group. Um, going through the winds, I was getting low on food and I needed resupply in a town called Pinedale. And I met these folks who were kind enough to, to give me a ride down into town, you know, 20 miles or so. Um, they were also nice enough to uh, offer to buy me lunch, which they may have regretted afterwards considering my hiker hunger at the time. Um, but really nice group of, of, uh, of kids and, and their, their parents. Uh, <coughs> So back into the winds for a couple more days. Just some beautiful scenery here. All the water, water you could ever want. And still a fair amount of snow around. So last day in the winds. Um, and you can see we're, we're starting to head downhill here and, and just we're about to leave this, this mountain range in, in central Wyoming. And almost immediately you, you leave the mountains and you're back in you know, the, the grasslands, the prairies here. And we're, we're at this point approaching uh, Yellowstone National Park. Before getting there, um, I needed another resupply and I did so um, 
in uh, a town called uh, Du Bois, Idaho, uh, Du Bois, Wyoming. Uh, it just so happened that uh, the night that I was in Du Bois, um, there was also um, a group of about 20 bicycle riders going uh, westbound across the country. So we converged on this church here, which hosted um, hikers and bikers for the night. And we completely took over the entire room here with people lying all over the, you know, the floor sleeping. And that, the interesting thing about getting into boys for me anyway was that it was the first time I've ever hitchhiked and got a ride with an 18-wheeler. So I met this Frenchman named Mummy in Du Bois at that church, and we hiked together for a few days, and here he is um, crossing uh, or fording one of the fairly good-sized rivers. Um, it's called the North Buffalo Fork. It's probably you know knee or so deep with a fairly strong current. So um, he didn't use poles, so he had to, to grab a stick to help himself keep his balance getting across this river. So at this point, I've entered Yellowstone National Park. Um, I happened to be all alone on the trail this day. Uh, well, the trail actually walked along this beautiful sandy beach. And um, I was feeling pretty filthy. It had been you know, three or four days since my last shower. Uh, there's nobody around at all. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go skinny dipping in this lake. So I stripped down, jumped in the water. It was beautiful. Felt nice and clean, got out started dressing, putting my really filthy clothes back on. And I realized, you know what? My clothes are so dirty, they're making me dirty again. So then I jumped in a second time, fully clothed, to try to get them clean. So Mummy and I stayed at a campground called Lone Star Campground, which is only a half mile away from Lone Star Geyser. So we actually ate dinner watching this geyser erupt over and over again for a couple of hours. Um, and uh, at this point, I had made travel reservations um, to get off trail for a week and fly back to Michigan where my daughter was going to medical school and where she had a white coat ceremony, which apparently they do at the beginning of medical school. So um, I was in Yellowstone, at, uh, basically at Old Faithful. I had 80 miles to hitch down to Jackson where my flight was leaving from. So I, I gave myself an extra day to get there. Um, and Kim Possible, who um, set me up with her friend Isabel in Pocosa Springs, also sent me up with a friend in Jackson, Sarah here, with her, her uh, boyfriend Jimmy. Um, so Sarah put me up for two nights. Um, it turns out I made the 80 mile hitch in one day, although I'd given myself two. So she put me up, she fed me, she lent me her car so that my the day in between or day before my flight, I was able to drive to Idaho to get a root canal because my tooth had been bothering me pretty badly. And then coming back the other way, um, she put me up for night and she actually dropped her car at the airport so when I landed, I could drive it back to her house. Uh, incredible trail magic. Um, and this is a picture of um, my daughter's boyfriend, Jack, my wife, Tor, Victoria, my daughter Sonia, and myself at her white coat ceremony. So back, back to work, back to the CDT. Um, the, the day I got back was August 1st, uh, or I, I flew back the 31st, um, hitched from Jackson to back to Old Faithful, another 80 miles. Got With two hitches, I made it there by 10.30 in the morning, amazing. And then I had to hike out of the park because I didn't have reservations to sleep in the park. Um, this is some of the scenery I saw along the way. So in addition to making it out of Yellowstone that day, I made it to the Idaho border. Uh, no license plate here, but um, there was a, box of, uh, a bottle of Jack Daniels, so I took a sip of that to celebrate, new state. Um, and I uh, was you know, pretty happy to, uh, to have accomplished so much in a single day starting 80 miles south in Jackson. Uh, one of my favorite days, I, I caught up with a couple people um, in Idaho here. Uh, Cash, he's from um, Canada, uh, the, the westernmost province, province. And then uh, 
the, the other woman here, his name is uh, Miss Hap, and she was also attempting to complete the Triple Crown this year. In fact, if you look closely, you might be able to see an AT tattoo on the back of her calf. And this, this picture here, I just, I love, you know, it was late in the day, the sun's getting low, and we're walking through this field of flowers right into the sunset. It was just absolutely gorgeous. So a lot of my um, memory of kind of the Idaho Montana border hiking was these kind of grassy ridge walks like this. Um, I met up with this group, um, uh, this guy in front's named Raider. He's a retired Marine. And um, then the, the guy behind him, his name is Pitch, who's a, basically works for the FAA equivalent in, in Canada. Hiked with them for a few days. Um, if you if you ever wonder why or why they call Montana big sky country, um, this picture attempts to answer that question. You just feel like, you know, the, the landscape goes on forever. Uh, and the guy in the left in this picture, his name is Snurgle. He's a 28-year-old from England. He was 28 at the time, two years ago. Um, we had hiked briefly together in northern, uh, northern New Mexico and Colorado, and we he, we both gotten off trail and we got back on around the same time. We met up here in this town called Ledore, uh, Idaho. And we decided, you know, split a room for the night um, and, uh, you know, hike out of town the next day. Little did I know we'd actually hike all the way to the Canadian border together. Um, he told me at the time that, you know, every day that we're not going into or out of a trail town, I want to hike 30 miles. So I... I didn't think that I'd stay with him for very long, and he was an incredibly strong hiker. But somehow, um, you know, what we'd, the way it would work is he'd sleep in. My last act walking out of camp each morning was to wake him up. He'd be sound asleep in his tent. He'd, uh, he'd pass me a couple hours down the trail, and then I'd keep going, and then I'd see him, like, taking a you know, snooze beside the trail. I'd pass him. We'd keep leapfrogging each other, most of the day, and by the end of the day, we'd arrive at camp around the same time. Um, there was one day where he said to me, you know, hey, Slim, you know, tomorrow looks like if we want to do 30 miles, it's going to be over 8,000 feet of vertical with six major passes we have to go over. He told me this in the evening, and I slept on it, woke up the next morning, and I real, you know, I, I was, at that point, I determined that, um, you know, the heck with it. We're going to do 30 miles, even if it kills me. Well, um, it wasn't until the fifth pass on that day that I realized that he'd been using reverse psychology on me, that um, we both knew he was plenty strong enough to do those 30 miles, and that if there's any reason we couldn't, it was because of me. Um, so anyway, I walked into camp at 9 p.m. feeling really proud of myself, but realizing that he'd, uh, he got me on that one. Uh, this is Lemmy Pass, where uh, Lewis and Clark went through when they were um, mapping out uh, the western states back in 1805. And there's a really nice campground that uh, Snurgle and I stayed at somewhere down in those trees down there. Uh, one nice thing about uh, hiking through um, Montana, so at this point we've, we've turned off of Idaho, we're now in Montana for good, is Alpine Lakes pretty much every day. I'd get a, one or two opportunities to go for a swim and to, to get cleaned off. And, and also, just jumping in cold water really refreshes you and just gives you a jolt of energy. So we went through this town called Anaconda, and I thought this was cute that this mother deer was walking down Main Street with two does in tow. So this is uh, Snurgle and I. We just actually um, had a, a raging rainstorm and lightning storm go through. We're in the Bob War Marshall Wilderness now, um, pretty close to Canada. And that big um, big rock wall there, it's, uh, it's called the Chinese Wall. It's, it's what's known as an escarpment. It goes on for about 12 miles. And it's about 1,000 feet from the base to the, the summit of that, that wall. So one of the things that um, makes the, the CDT so brutal is is the blowdowns that you encounter all the time. Um, this is one of them. Um, basically where trees, maybe there's been a fire 
has gone through several years ago or something, and then wind comes through and knocks down a bunch of trees. And they can be, you know, lying on top of each other, sometimes stacked three deep. And you basically your object is to make it over or under or around, you know, these these pile of trees, and it could just kill your progress. And, and it's not only is it slow and tiring, but it can also be very dangerous because in some cases you've got these sharp branches protruding from the trees. And if you slip on one of those, you can get impaled and, you know, really do a number on yourself. So the last four days on the through hike, uh, we went through Glacier National Park and I've been to some pr pretty beautiful places in, in the world. Um, the west coast of Norway, Grand Canyon, the Alps, New Zealand. Um, Glacier is, is right up there with, with all of those. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, these mountains that rise into the sky with beautiful alpine lakes. Um, we were fortunate to have, you know, perfect weather for those four days, you know, nice and sunny in the 70s. Um, by this time, it was uh, late August, early September, so the bugs were all gone. It was just really enjoyable hiking those last four days. This is, um, um, this is uh, Triple Divide Peak which separates three watersheds as opposed to two. So on the left is the Atlantic watershed. Behind the peak is the Pacific, and to the right is the Arctic. So it, uh, it's a pretty cool place where water flows to one of three oceans, depending upon what side of the peak it falls on. Uh, this uh, is Swift Current Pass. It actually reminded me a lot of, um, of basically a, a larger version of um, Tuckerman's Ravine in the White Mountains of Washington, uh, on Mount Washington. And the trail was heading straight towards this head wall here. And I was thinking to myself, you know, how are we possibly going to be expected to climb over that head wall? But just before we got to it, the trail took a sharp right and, uh, you know, made its way around um, the head wall. This is kind of looking west. And then if you look in the opposite direction to the east, you can see through the end of that valley is, is basically the prairie in northern Montana. Uh, last day on the trail here, just, um, you know, typical scenery and, and glacier. This is the very last pass going up along the trail. And the guy up ahead there, his name's Karaoke, who I hiked with the last four days. And then going down the last pass. And then finally, after 135 days, we made it to the monument that separates uh, Canada from the United States. And those are the four guys I hiked through... Um, through the through glacier with um, so that's Snurgle on the left, Karaoke. Um, so Snurgle's from England, Karaoke's from um, Seattle, and then Leftovers. Uh, he's from uh, Poland, and the amazing thing about Leftovers is he actually started the trail weighing 300 pounds, and at this point he was down to 200. And then that's myself. So um, just a couple of numbers. So I started on April 21st and finished on September 2nd. It's 135 days total, of which 120 I was actually walking, so basically 15 zero days. Just, I did just under 2,700 miles, so approximately 6 million steps. Um, I went through five pairs of shoes, and I, I got my money's worth out of every pair. Uh, so the average miles per day was almost exactly 20. And if you exclude the zero days, is 22.5. My longest day was just over 40 miles through the Great Divide Basin. I spent 82 nights in my tent, 20 uh, cowboy camping, mostly in New Mexico. Um, my ha highest campsite was 12.755, the night my tent almost blew apart. Uh, consumed almost a million calories. And with that diet, I lost 20 pounds. Yes. How, how much were you carrying in your pack about? I mean, I know it yeah. went up and down. But. Yeah, so um, just before resupply, it'd be about 25, and then after, about 35. So about 10 pounds of food at each resupply. And then 
it also varied a bit with, you know, when we're walking through particularly dry places, I might carry as many as four liters, which is about eight pounds of water. Probably hiked alone, you know, just walking down the trail, maybe 80% of the time. Um, on the other hand, I probably camped alone about 30% of the time. Um, there aren't a lot of people in the CDT, so if you get in trouble, you could be waiting there for a while um, till help comes along, you know, another hiker. Um, there were a couple of times where I didn't see anybody for several days at a time, you know, two days. Um, so... Yeah, unlike the, the AT and the PCT, there's not a lot of people out there. I think this year, maybe, or 2022, about 700 people started and about 200 finished. Yeah. If you're using some sort of a GPS at times, like how are you keeping it charged when you're away for yeah. hours at a time? Yeah, so typically it was about four or five days in between trail towns. So I had a... 10,000 milliamp hour um, battery, external battery, and that would give my iPhone about four or five charges. And actually, pretty early on, I, I bought another 5,000. So I, I had plenty of juice for the most part. Yeah. What, what was this like in your head? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I... You, know, you obviously have a lot of time to think. And one of the things I would think about um, was uh, what I was going to write in my journal that night. Um, another thing I would think about a lot, particularly when I was getting close to the next trail town, is what I was going to eat in town. You get awfully tired of eating you know, granola bars and chocolate bars and so forth. So um, I was thinking about food an awful lot. But um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I, I would just walk along and really enjoy the the beauty of the scenery. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. That was really great. Thank you. Um, two questions. One, what brand hiking boots do you wear? And two, um, what do you miss the most? So in terms of shoes, I actually didn't wear boots. I wore um, Brooks Cascadias. They're trail runners. They're kind of like running shoes, but they're ruggedized. And they give you... You know, I, I got almost a thousand miles on one pair on the PCT, but I usually got about 600 miles before they were pretty beat up. Um, what did I miss the most? Well, probably my family, particularly my wife and kids. Um, uh, what else did I miss? Um, I don't know, sitting down and having a cup of coffee. I really didn't, the only time I drank coffee on the trail was when I was in trail towns. Um, so I missed that a lot. Um, but I don't know, there's so much uh, stimulation out there and, you know, so many things to keep track of in terms of, you know, resupplying and making sure you, you know, you have enough water to get to the next source and so forth that, um, I don't know, didn't, there wasn't that much I, I really missed. And you sound like a pretty good turnout. Um, what are you doing now in terms of hiking? Any friends around here? Um, I walk my dog for a couple hours every day. I'm retired now. So um, I've, you know, I get up to, to New Hampshire every once in a while, hike a bit, but, um, you know, I had a, a hip replacement uh, in January. And then unfortunately, my wife had a pretty serious action. She was hit by a car. So I sp spent a lot of last year just kind of helping my wife with her recovery. So I, I haven't, haven't done too much hiking, you know, over the last year or so, although I, do have a, a winter trip plan for February, which I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Um, there's a question online about the tablet camping. Are yep. you preparing this as wild animal attacks? Um, Cause it's mental. Is there a difference? Yeah. <laughs> Th there was one time when I was in the Great Divide Basin and I was thinking of cowboy camping, but I saw these um, pronghorned sheep running really fast, you know, <laughs> across the landscape. And I, for that reason, I set up my tent just so that they might see that rather than, you know, stomp on me as they ran, flew by. Um, there was another person I know who used to, uh, what she wear? She wore a, a, her base, a, a, the uh, headgear because she slept with her mouth open and she was worried about, like, bugs going into her mouth at night. 
But I don't know. I wasn't particularly worried about cowboy camping. Yeah, it was all iPhone. Yeah, yeah, iPhone 13 Mini. Um, yes, I did. I saw a couple of Roadrunners in New Mexico. I had never seen them before, and if um, if Sputnik hadn't known they were Roadrunners, I wouldn't have known. Yeah. Who took that picture of the, like the vertical drop? There was there was somebody out doing it. I just wondered, had oh. you just come from it or something? Yeah, I just crossed that, and then Band-Aid was following me across, and so I, I took that. The one, the snow traverse, yeah. yeah, yeah, that that was very scary for both of us. Yeah. Where you hiked the three of them, mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite? Uh, yeah. And, and yeah. why? You know, I got that question a lot after I finished the PCT, which I hiked second, and then I would always say, oh, I, you know. I I can't really tell you which one I like the most because they're so different, and I love certain aspects of either but to tell you the truth now that I've done the CDT I think I like that the most it was definitely the most challenging particularly at age 63 um, I was 55 and 59 respectively on the AT and PCT so it it pushed me pretty close to my limit um, I was uh, I don't know I, I I got done and I didn't feel like I could have walked another 100 miles at that point um, so I feel a lot of pride about having completed that one. Um, and I think also the, the, the beauty on the CDT is, I mean, the, the PCT has incredible beauty as well, but uh, I think it's just even a little more on the, the CDT. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you.